The point of this video is to illustrate the parallel worlds of real-life vectors, if you want to call them that, and component spaces. And as we always do, we'll use geometric vectors as our first example, and then we'll use other kinds of vectors in subsequent examples. And the first operation that we'll use to illustrate component spaces will be that of simple addition. But even with simple addition, we'll be able to emphasize our main points, that all bases are created equal, and that we're free to choose whatever basis we want, and that ultimately the choice of basis is dictated by the problem. Well, here we're not trying to solve any interesting problems. So what we're going to do, because there won't be a natural basis for the problem, is use two different bases, just to illustrate that the freedom to choose the basis is ours. So here's what we're going to do. We're first going to add these vectors together straight, without any bases. And that, of course, goes to show that most of the operations in linear algebra don't require a basis. Once again, we're 200 videos into the course, and we haven't used bases much at all. Bases are not required for most of the fundamental concepts of linear algebra. Most of the things can be done without bases, but then once you choose a basis and convert everything to their components, you can perform the exact same operation, or let's say the corresponding operation in the component space. So that's what we'll do now. We'll choose a basis, convert all the vectors A and B to their components with respect to that basis, and then we'll perform the addition and component space, and then we'll see whether we got an answer, the answer, that's consistent with our original answer that we obtained without components. So here we go. Let's first, before any basis is drawn on the board, add the vectors A and B together. We're, we'll of course do it by the parallelogram rule, or tip to tail, and the sum lands right about here. Okay, and here is A plus B. It's a geometric space, so we use the pure geometric construction to come up with this answer. And here is our answer, and this would be called a basis-free demonstration, no basis involved. All right, now it's time for component spaces. And it always starts by introducing a basis. I'll use a yellow chalk for everything that has to do with this basis. So let me choose a basis. We'll call its elements E1 and E2. And let's see, so we're free to choose it, so I'll just try to be a little bit creative. I'll make sure it's not Cartesian, that's for sure. So here's our basis. This will be E1, and this will be E2, oops, E2, that's our basis. In fact, let's denote it by the letter B, and let's write that B consists of the vectors E1 and E2. All right. Now that we've chosen a basis, the next task is to decompose vectors A and B with respect to this basis. So let's do that on the component side of the board. So the vector, we'll start with the vector A, and I still chose this basis to be orthogonal, so I believe it's relatively easy to see. Now it's a decomposition problem. So if you're struggling with this a little bit, you'll have to go back and review decomposition. So, but with respect to this basis, decomposing with the naked eye is not a very complicated task. And the vector A equals none of E1 and minus 1 of E2. So the way we'll write it down, I'm just making sure space is good. The way we'll write it down is the following, that A equals 0, negative 1, with respect to the basis B. Now this may seem funny, a little bit funny, because on the left we have an arrow and on the right we have a pair of numbers. And how can you say that a directed segment, which I've always insisted is a pure geometric object, no numbers involved, equals a set of numbers? That's like saying cat equals green. You cannot <laughs> make a cat a color, two completely different types of things. Well, it's this B that makes it all make sense. 
because what this is really saying is that a equals 0 e1 minus 1 e2 0 e1 minus 1 e2 so because of this b here which you have on the right is also just a geometric vector it's just that it's written as a linear combination of e1 and e2 that are inside this b and those coefficients are 0 and minus 1 so I'm really still not saying that a geometric vector equals a pair of numbers right? even though it's beginning to look that way I'm certainly saying they're very closely associated they represent each other they are equivalent but they are different things so if you want this equal sign to actually make sense because I could have used a different symbol for uh, is uh, corresponds to or is equivalent to I could have used maybe a wiggle or uh, equals with a dot meaning, meaning kind of and so forth but I chose an equal sign and that's once again because you can interpret the right hand side as 0 times e1 minus 1 times e2 so it's a linear combination of geometric vectors so it is 2 a geometric vector so this makes sense all right now let's see let's go to the right of where we were and express the vector b and again the more we work with component spaces the more you'll get used to the equivalence uh, between geometric vectors and other kinds of vectors and numbers but we're not doing it in a blanket uh, a priori Cartesian way we're doing it right we chose an arbitrary basis and now we're working within the confines of that basis so importantly we have not given up our right to choose whatever basis we want which if you before you even start solving the problem you start by drawing a Cartesian grid you have kind of given up and that's very much contrary to the spirit of linear algebra but in any case b equals as I'm drawing this as nicely as I can you should try to think of the numbers and making sure that it fit uh, I'm not sure on that screen yeah it's in there okay b well b is half of e1 plus e2 so this basis being orthogonal is really helping us with this naked eye exercise our next basis will not be orthogonal it will be a little bit more difficult what did we say? 1 half negative 1 1 half negative 1 we can now add a and b in the component space so here's an operation purely in the component space a plus b equals I don't think we need to write down this plus this we can just do it in our heads and it's 1 half negative 2 1 half negative 2 and here comes a moment where we have to say the right thing this is not the answer these are the components of the answer so a plus b equals 1 half negative 2 with respect to the basis b so it's really saying that it's 1 half of e1 minus 2 of e2 now let's see if that's correct 1 half negative 2 1 half of e1 plus 2 e2 so 1 half of e1 is right around here 2 negative 2 e2 is right around here add them together and we arrive at the exact same vector as before so what we previously did correctly we now performed in the component space and we have demonstrated that we get the same answer so the way a complicated problem would work in real life would be a little bit different in real life you, you might be faced with a problem so complicated that you might not be able to carry it out without the help of components so you wouldn't have the, an answer to compare it with right now we're just making sure that this whole concept of component spaces works but in real life you're using component spaces because you have no other choice in that case it works in the following three-step sort of way you choose a basis and once you've chosen the basis and you decompose everything in the problem with respect to that basis you have converted your problem to the component space 
Then you perform, you solve the problem in component space that we did right here and got our answer, but it's not quite our answer. It's the component space representation of our answer. We have to be very careful about that. So component representation of our answer. And we now have to get back to the answer in the real world. We start in the real world and we have to end up in the real world with the answer. So what you do is perform the third step. I guess I should point an arrow here where the answer is converted from component form to the real life form. And that's the answer to our problem. This three step uh, approach to component spaces. Here we're lucky that we're dealing with a simple enough problem that we could solve it directly in basis free fashion. And having solved it directly in basis free fashion, we already know what this should be. So now we have a fortunate opportunity to make sure that the whole approach is correct. And we did, it worked. Okay, now it's time for a second basis. New color chalk, and let's see. How about, let's see. So the new basis will be called C1 EF, F1, F2, why not? Uh, let's see, we're once again free to choose the basis. I'm just trying to choose something sensible. How about E1? Uh, what am I saying? F1 and F2. F1 and F2. So it's becoming a little messy, but the different color is helping us. Can you see that it's different on the screen? I believe you do. You can. Okay, so with respect to this basis, let's call this the basis F. It consists of two vectors, F1 and F2. So once again, this is a very simple problem we're dealing with. It's really a non-problem, non but it will help us illustrate a few very important aspects of component spaces. In this case in particular, pay attention. Now that we've changed our basis, what is changing and what's remaining the same? For example, will these numbers be the same or different? Well, and the answer is, of course, they'll be different. Let's first express A. A with respect to this new basis. And it's easy to see that it's F2 minus F1. If it's not easy to see, uh, you should go back and practice decomposition. F2 minus F1, so it's minus 1, 1. Minus 1, 1. So right here, we're learning something very valuable, that all the numbers will change. When you go from one basis to another, all numbers in component space will change. Very interesting. Oh, F, with respect to F. And of course, B, to get to B, we have to take F2 minus F1 minus F1. That's how I'm doing this decomposition. So it's minus 2, 1. Okay, minus 2, 1. So B equals minus 2, 1. Completely different numbers from before. Once again, with respect to F. Okay, and now we can do A plus B. And of course, A plus B in this particular component space equals minus 3, big numbers, minus 3, 2. Minus 3, 2 with respect to the basis F. Once again, this is not the answer. This, these are the components of the answer. These are the components of the answer. So everything's different. This vector is different. This vector is different. This vector is different. So in this case, everything's completely different. But now let's see if this corresponds to the same answer. It had better do that. So we have minus three of F1, minus three of F1, one, so it would be 1, uh, let's see, let's just be honest. So I really meant this E1 to be twice as wide in the horizontal direction as this. So we have to go 1, 2, 3, plus F2, plus 2, F2. So it's this vector plus this vector 
add them up by the parallelogram rule, and you end up right here. So it works. Once again, it worked in the yellow basis, and it also works in the orange basis, and of course it would work in any basis. And this is an illustration of the fact that all bases are created equal. And it's up to us to choose one. And here we chose two different ones. And we learned that all of the intermediate numbers changed. That will not always be the case. When we're dealing with linear transformations, we'll learn that just about all things change, but there will be some things, even in the component space, in particular the eigenvalues, that magically remain the same. And some other so-called invariants as well, meaning some numbers that don't depend on your choice of basis, invariance. That's what we'll learn later. But in the case of addition, we're noticing that all numbers change. I cannot see one number that repeats, which is great. So all numbers, all the intermediate numbers change. The final almost answer changes. Of course, it's not the answer, it's the component of the answer. But then if we take these new components of the answer and reconstruct the real life answer, it is the same as before. Because, of course, the real-life answer does not depend on the choice of basis. In fact, it can uh, sometimes, at least theoretically, be obtained without the use of any basis. It can be obtained in a completely basis-free way. So there you go. This was our first demonstration of component spaces. Let's do a few more with other kinds of vectors.